Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'd like to start by introducing our dean. We're very honored that she's here, uh, Dr. Christine Billmeyer. Thank you, everyone. Um, on behalf of the university, I warmly and compassionately welcome the Whiteman family to this event this evening uh, in honor of Robert Whiteman graduate of the Master's in Bioethics program. I knew Bob from the time he became a student in the program, throughout his tenure as a student, and as a passionate and committed alumnus. And uh, I'm deeply saddened by his passing. I'm now honored to turn the program over to Dr. Robert Klitzman, director of the Master's program in Bioethics, from which Robert graduated. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Thank you, Christine. And I uh, want to thank uh, Bob's family and uh, our friends and his friends, uh, both his pre-Columbia friends and his uh, Columbia friends, and also uh, uh, Dean and Paul McNeil and Cindy Justice, who helped make this possible. Uh, it's my honor to welcome you here. Uh, and we're here for two reasons. Uh, one is to remember our friend and alumni, Bob, died sadly in February, and to celebrate his memory and his passion and spirit. And we're also here this evening to hear from one of our distinguished colleagues about the area that Bob was especially interested in, which was clinical ethics, dealing with patients on a one-on-one -on -one level. Uh, Bob was a great man, and his sudden death left us all here at Columbia shocked and in utter disbelief and um, very much saddened by it. He was, uh, as I've mentioned to several of you, a member of our first cohort of students, the first class of students that we had when we started our bioethics program four years ago. And he came to us having had already quite a range of experiences, having had degrees in law and divinity, a wide range of life experiences, having served in the military, practiced as a malpractice lawyer for several years, et cetera. And most importantly, though, he brought great passion to everything he did. From the outset here, he brought fresh suggestions for how we can make our bioethics program better, how to make it grow and develop, uh, and all of his ideas we incorporated in part with his help. Uh, in part with his input, we added new courses, for instance, in neuroethics, clinical ethics, science for bioethicists, ethics in the pharmaceutical industry, a new clinical ethics practicum, et cetera. And he embodied the best of bioethics, I think, given his range of interests. I think it was a good fit. Uh, and the program, I think, embodies much of his spirit and the breadth of his interests bringing together law and theology, real world dilemmas, small details, as well as the big picture everything from the practical to the ideal, the earthly to the divine. He saw bioethics not just at a one-to-one -one level, but also was interested in the spirit of the systems and organizations in which we all worked, uh, the education and practice of future generations of bioethicists, how we could really make uh, bioethics work better for all of us. After he graduated, he remained an incredibly loyal friend and supporter of our program, staying close friends with members of his class, and we have several who will be speaking about that this evening, and also volunteering to be a mentor of many students uh, who came in subsequent years. And I was surprised how many students he had managed to talk to informally at the, out, at the end of sessions when, like this that we would have, uh, and he really uh, helped them uh, enter the program, in some cases move to New York for the first time. When I wanted to start a new initiative, for instance, to have our students help each other read each other's papers to get them ready to submit to journals for publication, uh, I needed to find someone who would head the group, and I immediately thought of Bob, and he did a great job. When we had meetings for prospective students who were interested in the possibility of coming to our bioethics program, I would have to pick two or three of our alumni to speak to them, and I would always think of Bob, and he would always do it and would always do a great job. Uh, he continued to come to our events, events like this that we have, uh, and I knew he would, uh, and I know he would be here this evening uh, if he were still with us. And I think he's here in spirit, looking down at us now. And I'm not alone in my admiration for him. Uh, James Colgrove, who's here, who teaches our history of public health, uh, is a professor of history of public health, and teaches our history of bioethics course, uh, wrote, "Quote: Bob's intelligence, compassion, and good humor." added immeasurably to our bioethics classes. He had a unique gift for stimulating discussion 
and opening up places for reflection. He enriched our program not just by what he brought to it himself, but also by what he brought out in others. Josephine Johnson, who teaches our law and bioethics class, who unfortunately couldn't be here this evening, uh, wrote me the following. Uh, she was saddened she couldn't be here to meet his family. She wrote, Bob was a student in my course in 2012. Th that was the first year I taught the course, so I was nervous. And it, it was more than a little intimidating to find that one of my students was himself a lawyer with decades of experience in malpractice. But of course, Bob was generous with his expertise. He would hold back for a while so that other students could offer their thoughts and comments, and then he'd share his real-world experience with grace and humor. I was also lucky enough to get to know Bob a little better because I ended up riding home with him almost every week after class. Once we realized that we both lived in Westchester, he told me that it made no sense for me to be schlepping back and forth on the subway and train in the dark and cold, so each week after class he drove me to my door. I recall some great conversations on those smooth rides up the Hudson Valley. We would discuss ideas and arguments from the class and from the intersection of law and bioethics generally, where Bob would tell me about cases he had been involved with with difficult end-of-life decisions that he had dealt with firsthand. Or we'd talk about a paper he was working on. He had a youthful interest in bioethics and in the problems that animate our field. I was so shocked and greatly saddened to learn of his death. He was full of energy and wit, as sharp at atta as attacked, and was an absolute pleasure to work with. My heart goes out to his family at this sad time. And Arthur Kuflik, who teaches our philosophy and bioethics course, who unfortunately also couldn't be here, wrote, Bob brought life and wit, experience and understanding to each evening's discussions. To me, Bob was and is the spirit of what this program is and ought to be all about. I will always remember him in this way. These and other comments, and we have many of them, appear as part of a permanent website tribute that we've set up uh, on, as part of our Voices in Bioethics online journal. And our, the editor of it, our student editor, Brandon Sultan, will be talking about that in a few minutes. Bob will always have an important role in our program, and we and future students in our program will forever be grateful to him. I thought I would now show a film about our program in which Bob appears prominently. As I mentioned to some of you, uh, we decided to make a little film about our program, and I was asked to think of three alumni or students to, who might appear in it, and of course thought of Bob, and uh, he ate up the film. They, they As soon as the camera started rolling, he lit up, and uh, the filmmakers went ahead and spliced it all together and made it, and guess who ended up being the star? <laughs> so I'm going to show that. Bioethics is an emerging profession because we've had enormous advances in biotechnology. Now we have genetic testing for various kinds of cancer, as well as potentially for various traits. So people are saying that we may find genes associated with intelligence, genes associated with schizophrenia, depression, etc. And that presents all kinds of complicated ethical, legal, and social issues, and that demands having a group of people who are trained to think about these issues. Bioethics, biomedical technology is a major part of our lives today. Almost every newscast or newspaper or news magazine that one might pick up has issues that are reported relating to bioethics, whether it's healthcare issues, end of life issues, reproductive technologies, organ transplant issues. Questions about when do we begin, when do we end, how should we begin, how should we come to an end, are so big and important in the real world of everyday living but they're also very philosophical. We have some students who are mid-career professionals. Many of these students are physicians. They're lawyers, they have PhDs, they're social workers. Then we have dual degree students, students who are getting this and will then be getting a medical degree or law degree. And then we have some students who are just out of college or recently out of college. And some of them are deciding what to do. They're not sure if they want to go to medical school or go to law school or get a degree in public health or get a PhD in policy, for instance. This 
bioethics program is definitely beneficial for physicians because there should be more of a focus in bioethics, and unfortunately there isn't. I have a background in law, in theology, in medicine, and I find that all of those backgrounds are useful towards moving into the bioethics field. To know the bioethical issues that are involved in medical practice today is essential for giving the best care possible to patients. One of the great benefits is the training of the mind to think and to appreciate different ways of approaching problems. Doctors think differently than lawyers do, and it's nice to be able to integrate that and to experience the different ways of thinking that the different professors bring to the program. I think the thread that keeps many of our programs together is this notion that cross-disciplinarity, interdisciplinarity is really the future of the world. There are so many people that have multidisciplinary interests and don't know where to go and bioethics is it. There's something for the business student, there's something for the lawyer, you can follow policy, or you can follow the straight clinical route, you can follow every route possible. We're fortunate that we're the only bioethics program in the world that has a top 10 law school, a top 10 medical school, top 10 business school, top 10 school public health, top 10 philosophy department. No other school can begin to put that together. All of that is sort of open to you to be able to explore it and to create almost your own personalized path towards what kind of bioethics you want to practice. We have that breadth in addition to being in New York, which is a global center, and a lot of these issues increasingly are global, so Columbia has this great breadth. You build a network of wonderful people who are willing to help and willing to work with each other, and it's relationships, I think, that we'll have for the rest of our lives. To have people well educated in thinking about these issues and clarifying these issues so that they can contribute to the formation of our policies down the road is, is a really important contribution that I hope and believe that our Columbia program can be making. The more knowledge that we have, the more variety of knowledge that can be brought to bear on the questions facing us, I think the better the decisions are going to be. I'm now delighted to introduce you to three of our uh, students, uh, one alumni and two students actually. Uh, first, uh, Deera Holkauer, uh, who was a classmate and friend of Bob's. Thank you. Can everybody, can you hear me, everyone? Okay. Um, so at first, when I thought about what I'd speak about today, I thought I'd speak about what Bob meant to all of us. and. Then when I started writing, I really thought, well, I'd tell you a little bit about when I first met Bob, my first interactions with him, and what he meant to me. And as I read some of the tributes that are on the website that you'll get to see, I realized that my personal experience with Bob is really emblematic, emblematic I think, of the uh, collective Bob experience. So my real um, friendship with Bob began the second, time, the second time I met him, which was at the master's, and I guess the continuing education, uh, School of Continuing Education master's welcome party for the students at Casa Italiana. And the night before, I think it was the night before, we had had a um, smaller gathering for just the bioethics <laughs> master's students. And um, I had been very intimidated at that. <laughs> at that smaller gathering. I have been, had been out of grad school for 10 years at the time, and I was a lawyer, I am a lawyer like Bob, and was back for my second degree, which obviously is not nearly enough degrees to satisfy the Bob threshold for higher education, <laughs> but I do have a few more. I had some years to catch up, he had some years on me. Um, but I was undeniably, undoubtedly, and completely intimidated. And so the next night was the party at Casa Italiana, and. I had to convince myself to go. I was feeling phobic about being social and a little out of my element, but I dragged myself to the party. And I got there and I, I felt very lost. And the music was too loud and the people were too many and I couldn't find a home. And, and then I did. I was standing there terrified that everyone was smarter and more interesting and frankly younger. And then there was Bob. <laughs> not, not, a, not to point out his age, but he's slightly older than I was. And, um, I was going to leave, and then there was Bob. It was, felt like me and a slew of younger kids, and as I saw them, and Bob. And everything that was scary to me, frankly, was, seemed fun to him. And he took one look at our motley crew 
and assess the situation and knew exactly what it called for, a round of tequila. <laughs> now, this, my friends, was not a party with wait service, but somehow we wound up with a tray of tequila hand-delivered to our little round table, and you know who arranged that, and, and you know what they say, what happens in Casa Italiana stays in Casa Italiana. <laughs> But the truth is that that night, Bob made me feel at home, at ease, and like I'd somehow be able to do this back to school thing. So the first thing I really knew about Bob was perhaps the most important thing to know about Bob, that he could and would always make you feel like you're home. The warmth, friendliness, lightheartedness, spirit, and frankly the love that Bob brought that evening, well, he just kept on bringing it, both in class and out. In class, there wasn't a topic about which Bob did not have something to say. His excitement about bioethics was palpable, and his wealth of knowledge and experience unfathomable, and his spirit indomitable. In philosophy of bioethics, we met theologian Bob. In law and bioethics, lawyer Bob. In history of bioethics, omniscient Bob. <laughs> there didn't seem to be anything he didn't know something about. My first month in school, I took to scribbling down his openers, the things he would say before he sometimes finally made his point, and his stock of aphorisms was seriously admirable. Whether it was Thomas Aquinas or Benjamin Cardozo, Bob had a way of working in those classics. I think, though, most remarkable to me was the Bob I knew outside the classroom. I decided to look through the email exchanges between Bob and myself, thinking I'd share with you some of the wisdom he so graciously imparted to me. And then, sadly, I realized they consisted mainly of emails between, sent by me, honestly, between 8 p.m. and 4 a.m., where I would be in the throes of some nervous breakdown regarding some paper I was writing, which was likely due the next day, and Bob would have been done for hours, if not days, and he'd tell me I was gonna be fine, and I was smart, and I could do it, and sometimes when he realized I might not be fine, he'd assure me that if I asked nicely, I'd likely get an extension. He'd offer to call so we could talk out an idea or invite me for a drink or coffee to calm me down. And there wasn't a single email from him in all of those I read that didn't contain some thread exposing his deep love of life. He was flying here for a 90th birthday, heading down to South Carolina, talking about spending time with his family, whom he loved so much. Or sometimes it was just a happy exclamation about the sun and how I should get myself out of the library and out into it. That was Bob. Whether there were a thousand things on his plate or just one, he had time for everyone and always with a smile on his face. I think he was our best cheerleader. If Master's program had mascots, I have no doubt ours would have easily been Bob. And I looked up the word, and I saw that it came from the Provencal Moscato, meaning a talisman or charm. And I'll tell you, one thing Bob had in spades was certainly charm. I had the profound privilege of attending Bob's funeral and meeting his family and his friends who are his family and who are here with us. And let's just say it's not difficult to me, for me to see where he got his warmth in his class. Hearing the beautiful words that all of you shared about Bob and the fantastic and colorful stories, I realized I knew the man, but not all of the facets. And I'm sorry that I'll never get to see Fiddler on the Roof Bob or grill him for details about troublemaking older brother Bob, but I am immensely grateful that I got to know the Bob that I did. And I will miss his wit and his charm, his kindness and his enormous heart. I know we all will. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce you to Meredith Stark. Good evening to all, um, Mr. and Mrs. Whiteman, and Dale, and Karen, and Alex, and Caroline, and Elizabeth, um, and all the students and alumni and faculty who are here from our Columbia Bioethics community and our administrators who made tonight possible. Um, I just, good evening to you all, and, and thank you for allowing me to share a few thoughts. Um, and a thank you to Dr. Klitzman for organizing this wonderful tribute, and moreover, for asking me to speak, and for moreover, um, being such a wonderful mentor and friend to Bob. I know he just thought the world of, of you. Um, my name is Meredith Stark. I was Bob's classmate and his friend. Um, although time is limited, I wanted to just share with you three um, brief snapshots, almost in my mind, that I have of Bob. Um, because I think each brings home a, a quality that I just wanted to share that was, has been a big part of my life. And the first one is from the very first day that I met Bob. And it was in James Colgrove's History of Bioethics class, and it was a class which Bob absolutely loved. And it was a Monday at 4 o'clock, September 2010. I don't remember the Monday. I'll say the 8th. Um, 
and we ended up sitting next to each other. We didn't know each other. And, and Professor Colgrove, ever the most creative teacher, instead of introducing ourselves, gave us the assignment to look at our partner next to us, whoever was there, spend a few minutes learning about their lives, and then introduce them to the class. So we t I turned to Bob, we introduced ourselves. He then told me about this wonderful life. And as he's telling me about his amazingly rich experiences of um, his, his numerous uh, uh, graduate degrees, um, as well as his wonderful family, his time in the military, his time as a trial lawyer, his vast travel, and on and on. All I could think of was I am not going to be able to in incorporate or encapsulate this tremendous life in the three minutes we were allotted. And indeed, it was a challenge. But then the next, but the, what, what really stuck with me with that day, in addition to learning so much about Bob um, right in, in, a, in a, and having to say it back, so believe me, I was paying good attention. But what struck me that day was a, was a second aspect, which was that Professor Colgrove handed out a card to each of these groups. And on it was a seminal event in bioethics history. Now, again, it's our first day, so we don't know all that much yet about bioethics. But of course, Bob knew all about this. It was a legal case we were given. So we chatted and chatted and brainstormed. And we had this um, you know, kind of scratched out, I think, on a piece of my notebook paper, everything we could remember about this seminal event. Because what we had to do then was present it to the rest of the class and tell the class what we knew. So we had this kind of chicken scratch of all that we could remember. And, um, and I know so many of you know Bob, this, the second task we had to do was to decide which of us was going to speak, who would be the spokesperson. And for those of you who know Bob, you will know that he immediately volunteered. And for those who know me, you will know that I was immediately relieved. <laughs> so Bob took this piece of paper from me, cleared his throat, and just proceeded to give the most wonderful, uh, almost an opening statement of this almost a long, well-rehearsed, beautiful opening statement that he had just created from a few, uh, from a few bullet points scratched out in, in messy handwriting. And I was, at that moment, just awed by this amazing classmate and friend. And we very frequently sat next to each other in most of our classes. And for me, the quality that this memory, that this snapshot I have in my mind brings home is that throughout the five courses that Bob and I took together, and we also co-taught a research ethics section, so we spent a lot of time that semester. But for, throughout these five courses, um, Adira and Claudia, who were here, were likewise classmates of, uh, in these courses. Bob added so much to our collective learning. Um, he was prepared. He read extensively. He spoke eloquently. He had brilliant insights. Um, and as Adira alluded to, he just enriched the conversation. But even more than that, um, most of all, he added this energy and humor and brightness to our, to our classes, just class after class. Um, and as you can imagine that we have this wonderful faculty, and so much of the learning comes from the faculty. But as you can imagine, in these small classes, it also comes from the students as well. And Bob more than did his fair share in sharing just wonderful insights, thought-provoking ideas. And he really just, for those of us who learned alongside him, we are forever enriched by that experience and changed by that experience. The, the second snapshot I wanted to tell you was the very last day. Fast forward through the program. It's May 2012. And we are lined up on something called class day, which was the day that we would all process upstage and get our, our diplomas. So it's a smaller version of graduation. It was the day before graduation. So we had this elaborate lining up experience where we all had to go early and we had to be lined up in this way and that. And Bob and I insisted on standing next to each other. And then we proceeded to wait and wait an inch and inch throughout the, hall, the hallways of Lerner Hall while we awaited to process in and march in some glorious fashion. So we stood there and talked and talked. And the, and the one edict we were told was, don't leave the line. So we caught up for a long time and inched along, inched along. Bob told me about some of the plans he had in the works. He always had great plans in the works. And at some point, he left the line. He said, hang on, and he left. He comes back a few, a few minutes later, and he's almost this mixture of a big smile and a little bit of like, a, like tears in his eyes. And he tells me the following. He said, I heard a noise. Now meanwhile, picture all that. There are hundreds of people lined up in their gowns. Oh, Bob also teased me that day because his gown was pressed and mine was wrinkly. <laughs> and he said, I see you didn't iron your gown. <laughs> and I said, that's true. And I was trying to smooth it out. So 
he left the line and he came back and he said to me, I heard a noise, which I found hard to believe because it was filled with noises. And he said, the noise I heard was the noise my mom would make when she would call us. It was like a whistle or something when, she, when you would call the kids in for dinner. And as he told me the story, he teared up he, because when he went looking for that noise, he found you. And he came back and he told me and he beamed and he was just a kid again. He was just so excited that you both could be there for his graduation and he just was like a kid finishing eighth grade, you know, that you would both be there and that you called him. And so he was so delighted. And for, the, for me, that mo moment brought home the following. Bob was a bioethicist, a lawyer, a musician, a naval officer, a brilliant man. But he was above all those things a family man. And he loved his parents so, and he loved his kids, and he loved his two sisters and his brothers-in-law. And he just, that was it for him. And so as much as we talked bioethics, we also talked about all of you. And, and uh, above it all, he was a family man and he loved you all so much. My last snapshot is from a few months ago, October of, of just 2013. Bob writes me and he asks, are you going to ASBH, which is our bioethics annual meeting? And it was going to be in Atlanta. And so I said, yes. And he said, great, let's catch up there. So I fly in. I didn't, he I think flew in the night before. I fly in Thursday morning. I land at noon. I put my bags in the room. And I run downstairs to get my name tag because the sessions are starting at 1. So, I run downstairs and I finish registering and I go into this elevator and I'm the last person on a super crowded elevator at the Marriott or Hilton Atlanta, whatever it was. And the door is shut right in front of me and I'm just squeezed in. And all of a sudden, in a very, the elevator starts to go up and in a stern, stern voice from the back of the elevator, I hear, hey, no bioethicists in this elevator. <laughs> so I turn around realizing that could apply to me. Um, and there's Bob. And we made our way through these disgruntled Hilton guests to give each other a hug in this very busy elevator. Um, and we instantly got off at the next floor that had some chairs and we caught up for, for what was supposed to be a few minutes because we each were heading in two different directions, but which turned out to be about two hours. And while we talked and caught up, because we hadn't seen each other maybe in a few months, not long, but enough to catch up, I always started by asking about his parents. And he said, you were wonderful. That was the first, first item on the list. And then he would take out his phone. That's all the prompting he needed, and showed me pictures of grandchildren and other great pictures on his phone. But as we talked and caught up, after the, talking about his family, we always talked about the program. And Bob always had big ideas for the program. How could we fundraise for scholarships? How could we add online learning? He was just so excited. You could see even in the movie about the program. So as we talked about the program, first one person came out and uh, came by the, the seats where we were and said, hi, Bob. And Bob said, hi. And the person went on their way. 30 minutes later or so, a gentleman whom I recognize as being one of the heads of ASBH, an officer of ASBH, comes out, and I see him out of the corner of my eye. He walks up to us. I don't know him. And he says, hi, Bob. Bob's like, hey, how are you? And they start talking. And they're having all these big plans. The gentleman's from San Diego. Bob spent time in San Diego. They're reminiscing about restaurants. They have now plans to have dinner tomorrow night. <laughs> and finally, this man leaves. And I just I, you know, I have to ask, how did you possibly meet all these people? Keep in mind, this is Bob's the first day of the conference. And Bob's first time ever attending the conference. <laughs> so meanwhile, he had already become the life of the party. And through the rest of the days of the conference, I would occasionally hear a laughter or something coming from the conference room. And I would look over, and it would always be Bob holding court with all of his newfound friends. And it just took moments for him to, to uh, find a new home, just like Azira said. And so for me, this brings home that Bob was larger than life. He was outgoing, fun, funny, lively. He was just really one big smile. And like Adira, I did the same thing. I went back through my emails. And I have a terrible habit of not clearing out my old emails. My inbox has about 12,472, and I refuse to throw them out. And this drives home why. Because I went back to my old emails, and they were wonderful snippets, just like Adira had. But the very last email Bob sent me, and because I think of him as one big smile, the very last email he sent me ended with a happy face. Um, in a thread he entitled Greetings with a big exclamation point, he concluded, stay positive, keep smiling, and feel well, exclamation point, Bob. And then he inserted a big, yellow, smiley, happy face. 
Um, there was so much to love and admire about Bob. And in these last few weeks, I've thought, these last several weeks, I've thought so much about him. I've reflected on his life so much and wondered about the ways that I could incorporate some of these wonderful attributes into my own life. In that way, by integrating the very best of our Bob, your Rob and Robbie, his memory stays with us. It alters us. All of those out here whose lives he's touched. Um, mostly, we just want to express our deepest sympathies to you all his wonderful family and friends. Um, as much as he loved this program and adored all of us, his friends, he loved you all so much. And thank you for sharing him with us. We appreciate it so much. Thank you. Um, as so many people have um, admirably shared, Bob was really, a, truly an essential member of um, the Columbia Bioethics Program. And you know, here at the Journal, a lot of our staff members, you know, many of whom knew Bob, wanted to put together you know, something that will really last forever here um, in memory of him. We've actually dedicated our recent issue to Bob. Um, we have two things here that we have done, one of which, which I'll show briefly, is a brief you know, memorial for Bob over here. And then another was we actually posted an article that Bob had written for um, the program, um, for, for the bioethics program. And below we also, um, in addition to these you know, many reflections, um, in which we all invite you to please um, read at some point. We also, you know, mentioned one of you know Bob's big biggest accomplishments within the program. In addition to helping expand the program and welcoming so many people, was he, he you know he came out with you know a formal publication that um, he very you know has inspired me and many other students to see when while we're in this program what we really can do. Um, I'm going to read a couple of um, <coughs> s uh, statements and reflections from a couple of our students. This is from uh, Sylvia English, a current student in the program. Dear Bob, I'm thoroughly pleased to have met you and to have known you. Upon arriving to New York and at Columbia, I was a bit, a bit overwhelmed, but your friendly guidance made the transition a pleasure. I thank you most sincerely for the pleasure of having made your acquaintance. I look to you both as a peer and a mentor. You are and will always be a role model. Thank you for taking the time to welcome me and include me in your world. This is from Alana Walker. Bob's positive influence cannot be overstated. He had a profound effect on my life. Even though I only knew him for a short period of time, Bob was one of the first people I met when I moved to New York from South Carolina, and he helped ease my worries about such a drastic lifestyle change. Since that time, Bob was always there for me, providing me with encouragement and comic relief every time we met. My life is better as a, as a result of, being, of, of his being a part of it. I will always cherish the time that I knew him and attempt to live up to the jovial, witty, focused, intelligent, talented example he set. I will miss you, Bob. This is from Lynn Bush. My most vivid recollection of Bob was not in the classroom per se. Rather, it was when Bob was on stage and displayed his thespian talents in one of my vignette plays. Although many bioethicists and geneticists have portrayed the snarky 19-year uh, character, coincidentally called Bobby, Bob truly uh, captured the audience and ethical tension with his great panache thanks to his bellowing voice and dramatic flair. For me, Bob will always remain larger than life. This is from Bella Fishman. I'll never forget the first, e uh, first evening class of the first semester of the first cohort of Bioessex students. I moved to New York City only a week ago. I didn't know anyone and I was a little terrified of the walk I had ahead of me from the Morningside campus to my apartment in Riverside on 153rd. Um, I made my way down College Walk, and there was Bob standing right by his car. He spotted me and waved me over, asked me where I was headed, and, I immediately, and, and immediately offered me a ride. We had a wonderful conversation, and as he drove me home, um, New York City didn't feel as terrifying any, to me anymore. Since that day, I considered Bob to be a friend, a role model, and just a simply good person. Bob was one of those rare people who is fiercely intelligent and commanding, yet so incredibly thoughtful and gentle. He made the world a better place everywhere he went, and he will be greatly missed. Um, it, it's truly an honor to speak in front of his family, who has really helped you know, you know, foster and create such a general, you know, generous man and really an admirable mentor. So thank you.
As I mentioned, one of Bob's special interests was clinical ethics. And uh, in that spirit, we're very honored to have here this evening a special speaker this evening, Dr. Ken Berkowitz, who directs the National Clinical Ethics Consultation Service for the National VA system. Uh, a big job. Uh, and he's really one of the leaders in the field in thinking how we can move clinical ethics forward. Uh, Ken is an internist specializing in pulmonary and critical care medicine uh, and has additional expertise in home care and end-of-life care. He's a graduate of Brown University and is currently an associate professor of population health and bioethics and medicine and pulmonary and critical care at NYU. Uh, he's been involved in the New York State Task Force and Life in the Law and is really one of the leaders in thinking, as I mentioned earlier, how to take clinical ethics from not only a one-on-one -on -one level of patient to doctor, but in a broader level moving it forward. And I thought it'd be great to have him give a sense of, of uh, what bioethics, where clinical ethics is going today, because these were issues that Bob cared about deeply. Uh, and I know it's, it's a little bit shifting of gears, but I think it's, uh, Bob would appreciate it to, to hear about what's going on in the field. And so I'm honored to introduce uh, Ken Berkowitz. Thank you. Well, thank you for an introduction that my parents would be proud of. And I, I've really been looking forward to this um, talk on many different levels. Um, I love to teach. I love to talk about ethics consultation with upcoming generation of, of bioethicists and healthcare ethicists and try to impart upon them a little bit of my passion and my perspective um, and my insight from um, having done this for a long time. And I also look forward to learning from what the students teach me. But tonight turned a little bit um, even more special when this combined with the, um, a tribute to Bob. I didn't know him very well. Um, on one level, I met him four or five times at different Columbia events. But I feel like I knew him. He had this uninhibited, affable self that in the short time I knew him conveyed to me his the adjectives that everyone's been saying, this, this passion for ethics, this commitment to it, this spirit and this energy, which just was there. And he immediately um, was able to um, communicate that. And every time I saw him, he asked me for a job. <laughs> and I never for a minute felt it was in a negative way. I always felt it was because he wanted an outlet for his passion. And I think that that really um, um, was very special to me. So I'm happy to be here. And I hope that with a combined audience that I can give you a little bit of an insight um, into an aspect of his life that was probably very important, obviously was very important to him, but maybe was a little bit opaque. So maybe you'll come out of this with a little bit of an understanding about more about what was this sort of ethics stuff in some way. So that's what I'm sort of hoping for. For the students, I'm going to ask you not to take any notes. Let this <laughs> wash over you, OK? Everything that I'm going to talk about is on the internet. I have my business cards. You can email me. Every material I mention, everything is all available to you. You don't have to take any notes. So just look, try and let this wash over you. And because the time frame is compressed from what I planned, I'm going to go through certain parts of it faster than and, and others. So bear with me while I adjust sort of the pace of it. This was billed as a lecture on herding the cats, perspectives from a career in healthcare ethics. And where did that come from? Well, in the year 2000, I was lucky enough, having uh, been a practicing physician for a couple of decades and, and having really tried to formalize my passion and my interest in healthcare ethics, I was lucky enough in 2000 to get the job of Chief of Ethics Consultation for the VA National Center for Ethics and Healthcare. And if you think about herding the cats, we have 150 hospitals with 20,000 beds. We have over 1,000 outpatient clinics and nursing homes. We have over 8 million now, it's almost 9 million enrolled patients, and somewhere upwards of 275,000 um, staff. So if you think about um, the job of being chief of ethics consultation for not one hospital, 
not one set of university hospitals, but 150 hospitals all across the country. And all of a sudden, not only are you responsible for the ethics consultation that goes on there and accountable for it, but you're charged with what really excited me is trying to make it better and trying to make it better. And that's sort of that system level thinking is I think what um, the field is going through right now, the field of ethics consultation. For those who don't know, um, ethics consultation's been around for decades. But in sort of um, an old boys club, brown bag lunch kind of a way, every hospital in the country does ethics consultation and has teams of people who try to help in, when in healthcare, which is very often these days, when it's not obvious what's the right thing to do. And when you have multiple choices and you're trying to figure out what should be done or what ought to be done, what would be the best thing to do here in the face of choices, um, you really need guidance, okay? And to have that type of involvement in, in real important clinical decisions and actions and sometimes life or death things or decisions that in, in, impact patients in, in big systems with resource allocation without any standards for the field, without even an agreement on what it is, it's the only thing in healthcare that flies under the radar screen. And a big part of why I wanted to take this job and try and herd the cats was to be part of the effort to bring it onto the radar screen and to say it's not good enough to have it done differently everywhere and not to have standards and not to have high quality or ways to measure quality and improve that we have to really grapple with this. We have to herd the cats and we have to really bring this into the mainstream. So that's the job that um, I was faced with and the challenge uh, when I started this almost 15 years ago. Our office is the Veteran Health Administration's primary office for addressing ethical issues in patient care, healthcare management, and research. We really try hard to clarify and promote ethical healthcare practices throughout our system and across the nation, and our goal is to improve ethics quality in healthcare. So what is um, ethics quality in healthcare? I think that sometimes um, an iceberg helps you picture where ethics happens. There's obvious things at the tip of the iceberg that you can see, and those are the decisions and actions that we talk about and that everyone faces. But if you look a little bit beneath the surface, things that aren't so obvious, there's systems and processes, the way that healthcare systems are set up that can either push even good intentioned people towards doing the right thing or can be barriers and disincentives towards doing the right thing. So you have to be able to look at systems and processes that are affecting the way people work. And deeper still in healthcare, there's the overall environment and culture. That's the, uh, the, the, the political environment of the system. Do people at the top, do the leaders care about doing the right thing? Are the patients the most important thing in healthcare? Or are, are there other motives? And if you have a polluted environment and culture, the whole ethical iceberg sinks. So it's more than just the obvious things that you read about in the paper and the things that you think about and sort of the sexy ethics things. It's really all the way that the systems are set up to make things work right and the way that the leaders support it. So we took all of our 150 hospitals, which all had pretty well-functioning ethics committees, and we turned them over the past 15 years into what we call integrated ethics programs, which are still ethics committees, but it's a fancier name. And we have ways to address each of these three levels. And in our system, we have ethics, the function of ethics consultation that addresses those decisions and actions. And this is what we're going to be talking about today. And I think this was Bob's passion, and this is my passion. But in addition, our ethics committees have preventive ethics arms, which try to close gaps between practices that should be and practices that are. And if you can identify a gap and apply a quality improvement approach to it, you can close that gap and make the system better, which will prevent problems at the tip of the iceberg. And the third arm that we have is an ethical leadership function, which tries to train all of our leaders to make sure 
that they're promoting an environment and culture that supports the whole thing, that lets people know in our system that what we care about is not money, is not what Congress thinks, is not public perception, but what is right for that patient and that family. And that's really an environment and culture that we strive for. So that gives a little bit of an overview. Um, and now we're going to be up at the tip of the iceberg. And again, it's, it's daunting to think that you're going to um, try to move 150 ethics consultation services, who some are well-functioning and have a lot of expertise, and some are just getting by, and some are doing, quite honestly, a lousy job. And you're going to try and move them all in a good direction. First thing you have to do is agree on what is ethics consultation. And I bet you we could have in this room a whole debate about it. But uh, ethics consultation, as we think of it, is a service provided to help patients, staff, and other parties resolve ethical concerns in a healthcare setting. And there are countless ethical concerns in a healthcare setting these days. Now, this results in, again, at the tip of the iceberg, ethics case consultations, which are really dilemmas and analyses about patient-specific circumstances. And that's what most people think of when they um, uh, think of an ethics consultation. Should we turn off Joe's defibrillator? OK? But in addition, ethics consultation also involves non-case things. It's not about just a particular patient. It's about something that's more of an issue or a system level thing. It's if an ethicist is needed to provide information or education to develop or clarify a policy in an area or an interpret it, to review a document. Our system is coming out with a memo on organ donation or organ transplant or anything else. Can you look at it from an ethics perspective and make sure we're not stepping on any landmines here? Or sometimes to help people analyze hypothetical or prior historical or organizational questions that they're, that they're considering. So not should we turn off Joe's defibrillator, but can you help our cardiologists think about turning off defibrillators in general because that's something they're facing more and more and they don't know how to think about it. So we're really going to talk about ethics case consultation, but I wanted to at least mention that there are these other sets of, cons um, of consultative activities that ethics consultants are asked to get involved with. And um, much of what we say is, applies to them, but it's a little bit different. But for now, let's just think about the ethics case consults. I am just part of a team. Um, we have other people in our center. There's 30 of us now. They don't all work on ethics consultation. They work on other, uh, some of those other functions. But the reason I put up this slide is because I talk like this is about VA and the veterans' health system. There is nothing that I'm saying that is unique to the VA or that is not applicable outside of the VA. And all of our materials um, were developed with VA and non-VA experts and advisors. We had meetings. We had focus groups. We had conferences. We brought people together and said, how should we do this? OK? And so this is really, it comes from us. It's your tax dollars hard at work. Everything we do is available on the internet. And we love to share it. And we love when other people use it. We taught it in Taiwan. We've taught it in Canada. We've taught it, believe it or not, in Pakistan. Um, and it's adopted widely. So this is seen as a VA thing, but it's not a VA thing when it comes to ethics consultation. <clears throat> so what we decided was we needed to give people, if, if I'm responsible for 150 ethics consultation services, I can't hold them accountable unless I tell them what the expectations are. How will they do an ethics consultation? So we started with coming up with process. And we developed what we call the cases approach. Now, it's not rocket science. And I think it's pretty simple. If you're faced with a dilemma, the first thing you need to do is clarify the consultation request, see what people are asking you, why did they call you, and what you're going to respond back to them about. You need to assemble the information that you need to base your thinking and your analysis on facts, not conjecture on first-hand facts as best as you can. 
and on ethics knowledge and expertise. Then you need to learn how to do an analysis and synthesize that information, make arguments and counterarguments, see it from everyone's perspective in your head, and then come up with recommendations, responses to the questions you were asked, explain it to the people who are involved, and then you support the consultation process afterwards through getting feedback from participants, how you did, through looking at your own processes, through looking for systems issues in the consults to bring down to that other arm, the preventive ethics arm, and say, this is the fourth time we've had to address this. Can you please help close that gap so that people don't have to go through this another four times, um, et cetera. So this is laid out in great detail in our primer, which is on the web, ethics consultation. Joel is, knows about it. He was smiling because. Um, and this is the how-to manual for ethics consultation. And all the VA ethics consultants have to read it and use it and know it. It goes through that cases approach in detail. I'm not going to do it today because we don't have time. It's summarized on a little pocket card, which I have a couple copies up here if people want. But again, it's on the web. Um, and I was going to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to skip it for um, brevity's sake here. And we may get back to it in a little while to try and show you how to use this system um, um, to talk about a particular case. But it's not good enough just to tell people, read the book and go do ethics consultations this way. Okay. Next thing we had to do was education. And yes, we have the primer. Okay. But we also made a two-hour video course, which is available on the web, which is how to do ethics consultation. And it's an attempt at humor. Some people don't like the humor, but we try. And it's a little bit of a mod squad thing where there's people come in and they coach and try and coach a team that's having trouble and struggling and how to use this approach. We have what we call Beyond the Basics, where we took six particular skills for ethics consultants and we develop modules, and we give two-day face-to-face courses, and we've done nine of them, I think, so far, and we've trained almost 400 of the VA ethics consultants in these face-to-face, -face beyond the basics, once you're doing it, um, skills. Skills that are simple sometimes, like how to explain to people what an ethics consultation is and set clear expectations. How to tease out that ethics question when they come to you so you know you're actually answering their questions and meeting their needs. How to do an internet search and find the resources that you need to get that information to um, be able to um, anchor your arguments and your, and your logic in, in facts. Um, how to run a meeting when you're with family and other things. So real bread and butter skills of how to do this in the trenches um, better, which is really critical. Um, we gave about 80 um, teleconferences, which I'm hoping we're going to be able to start to do again, on ethics topics for people across the VA, which had hundreds and hundreds of callers each um, time. And we have other <laughs> online modules to teach people, for our ethics people, to teach other people, patients and staff, about different aspects of ethics. So we really try to give people education in ways to back up um, what they needed to do. We created tools. Um, the fanciest is called EC Web, and I'll show you a screenshot or two in, in a few minutes. Um, that is a um, internet-based, secure, national database, and every ethics consultation that's put in, uh, that's done in, in the VA system, case or non-case, are all entered into this nationwide uh, database, which has 150 partitions for each of our 150 hospitals. So each place can only see their own, but we can see all of them. Um, and one of the great things about it is the data entry for EC Web, which this is a screenshot of it, follows the cases approach. So not only does it um, um, give you a repository of information and good records and consistent records and thorough records, but you can't do your consults and use the system if you don't follow our processes. So it's a subtly subversive way to make people show us that they're using the cases approach. Um, and just a little anecdote, when I said to my boss, I said, 
well, if I'm going to do this job and I, I need a database for people to be able to put their consults in. And she said, well, what do you need? I said, I need someone who, you know, who can help me and I'm probably going to need like $5,000 to get this database going. Well, we're up to two million and, uh, and growing strong. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's phenomenal. It's an unbelievable tool because by having EC Web, which again, this is the entry screen to it, and it's only for authorized users, this is what a screen that an average service might look, and this is each row is a record of their consults. Um, and then again, each, each consult, when you open it up, is, is shows the case's approach. But it also gives um, the advantage of, um, I know Dr. Prager here, has been doing ethics consults for decades and doing a great job, okay? And he has thousands of ethics consults or hundreds all in his file cabinet, which is great. But what good does that do? Isn't it better to have it in a database when you can report on it, analyze it, where everyone on his team can see everything that's in there? If one day he leaves, that all those records are available to inform future efforts. So this is an amazing tool. In addition, it gives us the ability to report, assess, and do quality improvement on our ethics consults. And we have almost 15,000 um, ethics consult records in there and growing strong. And we're trying very hard to find a way to make it that non-VA facilities can tie into this system because there's strong interest from outside of VA for people to use this uh, system also. We have what's called our um, PAT, our Proficiency Assessment Tool, and our SPAT, which is a Service Proficiency Assessment Tool. This is the second Bible that anyone who's a student here that hasn't read it must read. It's not on our website. You have to buy it from ASBH. But it's called Core Competencies for Ethics Consultation. And this is not a VA document. It's from American Society of Bioethics and Humanities. But this lays out the standards for the knowledge and skills that ethics consultants need to be competent to do um, ethics consultation in high quality. So if this is the standards, and if this lays out the knowledge and skills, then we developed um, a proficiency assessment tool that every year all of our consultants have to fill out and assess themselves for how they are doing in each of those different knowledge and skill areas. And because ethics consults are often done in teams, the team has to have collectively high competency in all the areas that they're working at. So we roll up the individual proficiency assessment tools into a service um, assessment. And I'll give you a little idea of what a picture of that might look like. And this is the um, knowledge areas. Um, so for instance, moral reasoning and ethical theory. And again, these are the areas that you need to be proficient at if you're going to be a good ethics consultant. Um, shared decision-making with patients, ethical practices and end-of-life care, professionalism, health, um, health law relevant to health care, ethics consultation, et cetera. And if you can make a picture of your service, which that's what this is, and you can see how everyone is, your overall collective competency in each of these knowledge areas, you can start to make a plan to improve. And this is from our service at our center a few years ago. Um, and you could see that the red is advanced, the green is basic, and the um, blue is novice. Now, we're consultants that work at a, high, at a national level. I wouldn't expect us to have too much novice stuff going on. But what sticks out right here is we're not too advanced in this knowledge area, and we're pretty basic in it. Now, this is ethical practices at the beginning of life. And for the VA system, that makes sense. We don't do beginning of life, OK? We're doing it more and more. And as we get more female veterans and we get more beginning of life issues, we're having to look at this and address this and say, we can't get away with this anymore. That's not acceptable as we move forward. But every service can get a picture by using these tools of their competencies and can decide where to focus their um, professional development in these knowledge and skill areas. And it's thinking like this, even something as basic as saying, whoa, there's good ethics consultation, and there's less than good. And we're trying to make standards. And there's clear standards for what an ethics consultant needs to know and needs to be able to do, and to have tools to be able to do that. 
well, in cardiology, in pulmonary, in social work, in every other field in healthcare, pharmacy, rehab medicine, laboratory services, this exists, but it doesn't exist for ethics consultation. And that's not something that I can tolerate, and that's why I love my job, is that what we're trying to do is work with the standards, set the standards, move the standards, measure the standards, and strive for continual improvement. So we really take this very seriously, and we've tried to um, make it easier and support our consultants with the different tools they need. We also have very clear policies and standardized materials that they can use. If they want a brochure to give to patients or staff who are involved in ethics consultation to explain it, we have brochures they can give out. If we want posters to put up in the hospitals, what is ethics consult, when should I call, and how do I reach you, we make posters so that our 2,000 ethics consultants don't have to waste their time doing that. They can concentrate on improving their own knowledge and skills and doing their job. Support. You can't have services out there doing this without support. And the support comes from our center. We have our own ethics consultation service. If any time any of the, our consultants get stuck, they call us. And we help them. We help them think through the problem. We help them find the expertise they need. Sometimes we get involved with their meetings directly. Um, but we are a tertiary backup service that helps them in any way that we can. And we put our consults, which are consults to them, in our own partition of EC Web, and we're subjected to the same um, um, scrutiny that, that they are and what we do. And we have monthly calls for all of our consultants across the country so that we can teach them things and they can ask us questions, and it's very interactive. We're really trying to make a community of ethics consultants. And of course, there has to be oversight. We have national policies. We assess that people are following our standards. For instance, in our system, there's a clear policy. If you do an ethics, um, uh, doing ethics consultation, you have to certify you've read the primer, done the video course, you have to do our proficiency assessment every year, you have to make an improvement plan every year, you have to use the cases approach, you have to enter the, your consults in EC Web. So these are in policy which helps with the leaders because our consultants can go to the leaders and say, I have to do this. This is the standard that I'm being held to. And I think that we're ahead of the um, field in terms of, of doing that. And with that comes accountability. We give our people performance metrics and they have to report every quarter, every six months, every year how they're doing in certain aspects. And if there's room for improvement, we help them figure out how to improve. So it's really a, a very sophisticated, I think, and, and um, um, strong system in, in, in how to think about ethics consultation and how to make it happen and how to move it forward. Everything I've talked about for the students is here, okay? www.ethics.va.gov. If you can't find it, I have a card. My email's on the slides. Just call me and we'll help you find it because all of these things are meant to be shared and to be used and none of them are unique to only being able to be useful um, in our system. Um, these were the screenshots of EC Web. This is about documentation in the, in, the, in the patient's chart. A lot of ethics consultants don't think they need to do it. There's a lot of hospitals that says they shouldn't do it. I think that that's ridiculous. Um, it's, a, it's an important clinical activity. Um, the chart is supposed to record what's timely, relevant, accurate, and complete. And if you're helping people think through something that's relevant to a patient, then we expect to see notes in the chart um, that explain what you did and what your thinking is. That also makes you more accountable and makes you really think hard about what you're, what you're, what you're doing because everyone's going to see it. I mentioned feedback in the, that support step. We have an ethics consultation feedback tool. We ask the participants in our consults to um, rate us um, and to rate all of our consultants on um, what are really their perception of those of skill areas, because they're the ones who are on the other end of the skills and some of the knowledge areas. But did the consultants make you feel at ease? Did you feel respected? Did you think they knew what they were talking about? Did they give you useful information on and on and on so that we get feedback from the people who are involved in the consultation. And I wish that people would do this for cardiology, and I wish people would do this for pulmonary and pharmacy and everything else, because this is really not 
the, the outcome we're looking for, but if it's a service, if it's a consultative service, if you're responding to people who come to you, if you don't know how they perceive you, then you really don't ultimately know if you help them. So we take this very seriously. And across the country, over 30% of our um, consultations have feedback responses. And all of our teams look at their feedback every year and try to inch their performance higher and higher and higher. Um, how does this fit in with what's going on in the field? I keep saying this isn't about just about VA. Well, I think it's very synergistic with, with where the field is going. There's um, a lot of training programs, the bioethics master's program here. There's a group called the American Board of Program Directors that are trying to set standards for what a master's program in bio bioethics has to contain. What is that for that degree to mean something? So there's standardization coming in the programs. There's a move to credential consultants. And again, it's one of the few areas in healthcare where the people are not credentialed. And there's a pilot project from American Society of <coughs> Bioethics and Humanities called Quality Attestation, where they're really looking at, I think, where, where the rubber really does meet the road. We've done a lot with structure and with process, but this is looking at content. They did a job on an ethics consultation it's not as easy in cardiology to see if they follow as where it's known what the algorithm is and who should be on a beta blocker and who should be on aspirin and within 24 hours of coming here did you have certain tests and one hour certain other tests without those standards how do you know if someone did a good job and what we're really trying to do is look at the content of the consultations and that is a brutal thing and we've been working for years in our system to um, again through um, focus groups and work groups and Dr. Klitzman's been involved in numerous conferences to try to develop what we call a quality assessment tool so that a rater can read the consultation and say is this above the bar or below the bar and what areas should it have been better at and, and did they actually do a good job the consultants and that's really going to revolutionize um, ethics consultation when all of a sudden you'll have standards for the content of, of what's in there. And good news, I think I can say, that the um, ASBH quality attestation project just last week decided at their last meeting that they're going to use the VA tool to assess the um, written consultation records of the first group of people who are going through that pilot uh, year of the consultation uh, process. So um, I feel really good about that. And again, it just shows sort of the synergy of where the different things in the field are going. What's missing? To me, the third leg of the stool that no one's working on, that I stump all the time, and I'm hoping to get some traction. This is a team thing. And this is a service in the hospital. You can have a well-trained consultant who can show you a portfolio of six brilliant ethics consultations. And that doesn't tell me if that, that hospital has a well-functioning consultation service that's meeting the needs of the patients and the staff and the institution. Because just because they did 20 consults in the ICU, what about the clinic? What about the surgical service? What about the mental health service? How do we know if the housekeeper who has an ethics problem or the nurse or the social worker or the pharmacist who's asked to split pills to save money but says, I don't think that's right because they're not scored. And it's not about money, it's about patient safety. How do we know those people have access to the service? How do we know the service is meeting standards in the field? How do we know they're work being, uh, giving their responses in a timely way that meets people's needs? So just like IRBs these days are accredited at the IRB level, in addition to individual expertise, just like laboratory services, transplant services, rehab services, I'm pushing for a service level assessment of how well the ethics consultation function in each facility is functioning. And to look at what's a critical success factors that we can know that this is a good service. Not just that there's good people who can do a good job, but that they're meeting the needs of the patients, the staff, and the institution that they serve. So to me, this is the third level of the leg of the stool that's missing. And this is what I'm working um, through ASBH to try to move towards. And I hope that's where we go um, next in the future, in addition to the individual credentials and the program certification. 
So that's a lot. I was going to um, take the rest of the time to try to go through a case with the cases approach, but things got compressed. So I don't know if we have any time, but I hope that gives you a sense of, of, of how Bob was so excited about this. I mean, this is really coming together after 30 years of an activity that's been all over the place. And it, it's such an exciting time because things are really starting to coalesce and gel now. And the next 10 years is where it's really gonna, gonna change for all of you. So I hope this gives you a different view of it. I hope this gives you a different view of it. And I will take questions or please go join me. That was great, thank you. And I think Bob would have, uh, Bob was a natural at this stuff, needless to say. So he knew how to talk to patients, et cetera. And I think uh, getting other people to be like Bob is the goal. <laughs> well, I think what we'll do, because there's a reception waiting, is first we're gonna invite you back to go through in more okay. detail for students. I think it's, it's really, uh, I had a chance to look at Ken's slides and for the students who are really great, going through details and cases. Um, and maybe have students, everyone have a chance to talk to you one-on-one -on -one during the reception Could for everybody? questions. Questions, if that's okay. Sure. Okay, and um, uh, uh, and I just if I'd pass on sign-up sheets. If anyone didn't get one, or just make sure if you can just give us your email, so we'll send you the links to these materials. That'd be great. So with that, uh, again, I want to thank the people who helped make this possible this evening, uh, the folks from SCE, and we invite you to join us in the reception uh, outside. And again, thank you so much for joining us this evening.